event is meant to reflect, or start off by reflecting on the 30th anniversary of the Baltic Chain, uh, which happened on 23rd August 1989, when approximately 2 million people all over Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia joined hands across more than 400 miles uh, in a peaceful fight for independence, peaceful protest for independence from the Soviet Union. And this event then became known as the Baltic Chain, or sometimes the Baltic Way. Um, on the other hand, you might say, today hundreds of thousands of people from the three countries, including about 200,000 Lithuanians, um, are living in Britain, um, joining earlier waves of post war migrants. And while stereotypes, as we all know, about Eastern Europeans abound in the press, uh, we very rarely hear from people from the region themselves. Uh, and there is a lot that we can say about um, where geographic lines get drawn from. Right? So if it gets included in the stereotype of these European migrants, and I think um, maybe some of the work um, that you're doing will touch on that as well. Um, so the idea, on the one hand, is to mark the 30th anniversary of the Baltic chain, but also to use it as a jumping off point to think about the broader themes that the Wednesday Canvas series is addressing. So themes of post communist and Central East European identity, migration, and memory. And we're actually primarily tonight doing that through the work of two British-based Lithuanian artists, uh, Maria Nevchenko and uh, Simona Zemitia. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, um, I'll say more about your work uh, in a few minutes. We're delighted to have you here tonight. Uh, so just before we get started, since Eusta couldn't be here, she was um, she was very sad and offered instead to send some of her personal reflections on the Baltic chain and about the, her personal memory of the time. Uh, we have a few images up here which are some very iconic images. Uh, there's a lot of archival material out there and a lot of testimony as well. Um, there was a project, I think, for the 25th anniversary that compiled a lot of personal testimonies of the event from the three countries uh, that you can also find by Googling. Um, so I'm just going to pause for a moment. Um, so, Eustace said when I asked her if she would be interested in sending in some personal reflections, that she might not be the best person because she was only about nine or ten years old, right, at the time of the Baltic chain in August 1989. But I think that the question of generation and how this event has resonated also for people who were quite young at the time and maybe weren't politically active um, is one that's central to the discussions that are happening today uh, in Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. Um, and so I said, okay, but we're really just been hearing from you anyway. And I'm now going to put on my best use to voice which I will <laughs> Do by not actually changing my speaking voice because that would be strange, uh, but just pretend that I am there. My personal memory of the Baltic chain is that we sort of missed it with my mum. <laughs> my dad was away somewhere and it means we didn't have a car and my mum doesn't drive. So we ran to some place with people holding hands nearest to our house and then we were late. I think people were already leaving. I think I haven't experienced this event so really vividly as those who were teenagers when it happened. Like my friend, who was 12 or 13 at that time, Monica, said that she drove with her parents to some 64th kilometer of the chain to join hands. They somehow knew where more hands were needed. Maybe someone was calling them. Anyway, in the Baltics since, that, in the Baltics since 1987, one could say true democracy was out. The protests and gatherings were out in the open, and there was no threat of being caught. The Baltic chain has definitely affected me, and almost, I would say, created a Baltic identity. I don't think there was a Baltic identity before the Soviet occupation. So in a sense, occupation has created the Baltics as such. There was no Baltic identity before that. Moreover, if you would say Baltic Sea identity, then it includes not only the Baltics, but also Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Russia, etc. And then I asked at the end, why is it important to be talking about this particular piece of history in Britain in 2019? And Easter's response was, 
I think this is an important mark of the peaceful protest history, when an immensely large portion of the population comes out to speak out with their bodies. Euphoric as well. And I think that's something to really remember in the present moment. Now, Eusta ended by saying that she still cries when she hears the song Baltics are waking up. And I thought that we can't let this opportunity go by <laughs> without hearing the song. <laughs> which, um, which perhaps you can also then reflect on in the discussion. Are we going to sing along? <laughs> oh, we can sing along if you like. It is five minutes long, so perhaps we won't play the entire thing unless everyone is falling. Um, 
But yeah, uh, I think that uh, it's quite interesting to speak about Solus in that context because um, he, to me, represents uh, this uh, type of migrants who didn't, you know, they, they didn't necessarily travel in order to find a better job or to have a career or to have, I don't know, more opportunities in the field that they were working in. Uh, it was actually a political migration, which was migration for freedom, as he called. Um, and Solus was my family friend, so the way I got to know him was through postcards. He was the first person I ever knew who actually lived abroad. And at that time he lived in Israel. And I remember those postcards with like Jerusalem, and I knew there were Solus there. Um, and I met him about seven years ago when I myself moved to London and then because I knew that he was living in London at that time and uh, I found his story fascinating because he seemed to have done so much in those, I don't know, years in between of revolution when he escaped and, uh, and now. Like he was involved in last FM radio project, which was the first internet radio project, and you know his life went up and down, and it seemed that this, I don't know, there was this revolutionary imprint in him because when he left uh, Lithuania, he escaped with forged documents, so he basically left illegally because no one was actually, it wasn't so easy to leave Soviet Union, as we know, um, and I don't know, like it just felt that he was a rebel and he stayed a rebel, and I think in a way it also perhaps destroyed his life because he couldn't really just be. And although, I mean, um, although he probably wouldn't necessarily agree with, with all of it, but uh, he, was, he was filming throughout his lifetime, and I think this is, this is the material I'm working with, and I'll, I'll share some of it with you. Um, he was recording ever since 1988 in Soviet Kolnus, uh, up to uh, 2017 when he died. So I have this immense archival footage, which is really hard to put together. But I made uh, a short, uh, short video uh, already, which was commissioned by the Good Neighbor, and it's also supported by Lithuanian uh, Council of Culture. So I'm just going to play it, and it would be interesting, perhaps, to hear your reflections uh, later on to see how you relate to it, or perhaps not. It's about 11 minutes long. And so this was a mu music artist in the 90s, so... Vito, second one. Uh, <laughs> uh, and now, how uh, the <laughs> Down, down, down. Uh, up. 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 Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 um,
Creio lá que são muito toda a nossa música e com que eles vêm se tendo a turismo e a turismo I don't like it. 
of interesting to explore. Yeah. Um, I thought it might actually be a good idea if anyone has any direct questions about the film to just ask them now and then we can bring it all back together at the end, but just in case there's anything specifically about the film. I say that because I had a question anyway. <laughs> um, about the voiceover, I wondered if that was um, re recorded in the present or if that was also archival footage. So if he was reflecting back on that footage that he'd, he'd filmed through the years. Or... Um, he wasn't re reflecting on it, but that, because uh, when I met him in 2012, he gave me his digitized videos, so like a, a set of like one, two minutes kind of snaps of digitized tapes. And, uh, and that was pretty much the only real interview I've ever done with him. So, um, so this was recorded probably like in 2013 or something. So we kept on, I kept on filming him myself for like another couple of years and, uh, and after his death, because he mentioned that there are some tapes I was trying to find those tapes for like for years and finally we managed to digitize them and those tapes are already like so all the sound is mixed in so like all I'm doing is basically just selecting clips and putting them together but a lot of pretty much everything that's there is made by him and uh, yeah so so I guess I made him reflect on primarily on what happened in Lithuania and his escape um, and that was quite emotional for him, so I'm guessing that that was pretty traumatic to some extent. Um, because at some point he said, I feel really tired, can we just stop? And that's where the conversation ended, and yeah, we didn't do any other kind of sit down interviews where we talked. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, right, then perhaps we can. Okay, go on, yeah. Maybe practical, I don't know. It's something to do with the narration. And I'm wondering uh, how you, uh, what do you think about, uh, because not only it's uh, using technology of its time, uh, or rather uh, technology that kind of uh, is at the same time going to different places and it's completely different, but also how that technology in some way narrates the whole movie. And I kind of wanted to know more about that. How did you? Thought. Are you are you choosing purposefully to use the uh, kind of not only images of technology but the kind of uh, the aesthetic side. yeah the aesthetics yeah. of it yeah, yeah I mean that was quite challenging because the material that I filmed is mm -hmm. in very digital clean format so yeah. sort of like Canon 5D you know yeah. this very yeah sharp image stuff. So the only thing in that film that is filmed by me is the last shot. Mm -hmm. And uh, because his, his material is either shot on, I think it's not so great, but like, it's, or maybe it's eight, some sort of like pre-digital format, which is like a smaller type of VHS something. Oh, the little yeah. mini, mini DV something. It's not mini DV, no. it's another, it's, it's slightly bigger tape. It's, uh, it has eight minutes. Now I can't tell you the, the exact name of it. But like that was pre mini DV. Uh, so yeah, it's either that or mini DV. So I decided that the, the most logical solution is to keep it all in TV format, so like three by four. So I decided I'll reshoot the screen because Solis himself he shot screens a lot, like he would film TV. And I guess like in the 90s, you know, it was kind of fashionable to do all these layers and textures and, and he liked scratches and imperfections of sound and, and visuals so I somehow tried to preserve that as well um, and uh, and yeah like I think in terms of text I didn't want to do just like subtitles and I wanted to use those scratches that he liked and all these kind of you know when the tape finishes and you have blue screen and somehow incorporate those things um, so I was try I was experimenting with fonts, sort of trying to reference a little bit maybe record covers because he was a passionate record collector as well, mm. and he's got like this huge archive of vinyls which are just now sitting there not used. So it's my also like passion. I hope that I can do something with it, like we can create a music attack or something. So yeah, so it was more kind of trying to bring into the film those things that were really important to him. Yeah. Thank you. Any other direct questions or comments? Right, in that case.
Fabulous, let's revisit the film at the end. Um, so now I'd like to introduce um, our other artist, uh, Maria Nantenko, who's a Lithuanian artist uh, based in Glasgow. Sorry, artist who created learning activities facilitator, which I love as a job title. Uh, working in Glasgow. Oh, so that's, that's what we'll do. Uh, and she, she received her MFA from Glasgow School of Art in 2016 um, and her BA in Sculpture from Camberwell College of Arts in 2013. Um, and even though Glasgow is her base, she shifts between Glasgow, Kaunas and Berlin, where she exhibits and devises workshops, discussions and activities. Um, and she's participated in the Berlin Project Space Festival in 2018 and Glasgow International last year as well. Uh, she's also recently been nominated to participate in A in Kratan and Eflux residency program, Ways of Travelling in Romana, Palestine. Um, and also does a whole host of other things. Um, but <laughs> her most recent work is, um, uh, is about analysing suppressed identity displacement and broader socio-political problems associated with the question of the alien. <laughs> and I'll let you take it from there. Um, so after Simona's beautiful film, I feel like I'll almost give like a technical <laughs> red art presentation, but I hope it will be as enjoyable. Um, thank you for the film, it's actually really interesting to see it. And the moments in the film really made me feel quite emotional because it was something that... Um, I had this like really bizarre flashbacks from my childhood and the cafe that they visited. I remember that cafe of going down myself and it was just really... I feel a bit strange <laughs> seeing you. So, um, yeah, so my name is Maria, and like um, Shpila said, I'm living an artist based in the UK for over 10 years. And, and I guess increasingly so, it became really important for me to stay there with a Lithuanian artist, uh, living here for so so years, and in London and then in Glasgow, because it kind of became as a way to blame my hybrid identity that I feel I have lost through these sort of years of adaptation and kind of, in a way, indirectly forced the pressured adaptation that I guess uh, some of the migrants uh, face. And it became like a quiet protest in a sense. And the exploration of my um, not only Lithuanian but also Russian Lithuanian identity crossroads that stretch as far as Caucasus. It is embarrassing to admit it now, but there were time uh, when I just came to UK that I was quite embarrassed to say that I'm from Lithuania and I would try to pretend that I'm from Sweden or Norway or something that sounds a bit more less Eastern European. But my accent and my face at the time would speak instead, and given kind of an unspoken permission to some of the people, nationals here to look down upon me. Um, to slow to spell out simple words such as latte or change <laughs> and kind of throw in presumably um, innocent and xenophobic comments. But now, contrary to the time before, I feel very proud not only of the country that I come from but also of my mixed background and the community that I once was part of. Also, I forgot to put a, for a presentation which kind of also, I guess, me and my mother, <laughs> but we will uh, just go away from this image and, and it kind of, um, so writing this presentation I kind of realised that it's a bit turning into my turn into this like one of the shows where people pour their hearts out about the immigrant life, so kind of off, 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 opera style kind of um, show, but hopefully not too much, but since it's about identity or what I'm talking about identity, it became kind of important. And the whole presentation kind of became more of experimental nature, like a free flow of thoughts and research fragments that inform my practice. And upon thinking how I could relate sort of my work with this talk to Baltic Way or Baltic Chain and how I could navigate this presentation that kind of makes sense. I decided to go for a personal connection to it and expand from it to a sort of broader identity related issues. So it's a method that I often apply in practice where I kind of concentrate on my own personal experiences and sort of widen up uh, broader. 
So I want to start from the coincidence between the Baltic Chain of Solidarity, which I think also is the most mesmerizing and beautiful act of commons and unity and my personal life. So I was born not long before the Baltic Way, and the events unfolding at the time had a huge impact upon my identity's development. As you can tell, my signing is in Lithuania, and part of my family is Russian, and I guess the story will present a slightly different kind of angle maybe to the Baltic Chain. Um, so the Baltic Chain was a force that influenced Baltic states gaining independence from the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union saw them eventually falling apart. And my father's side of the family comes from Moscow, and it happened so that after these events unfolded, I have um, never seen my father, my father's side of the family, kind of fading with my whole Russian sort of roots and identity. Um, so there were some kind of problems with the family before, but the independence has kind of shown and made the Lithuanian-Russian connection extremely difficult. So I kind of grew up in a family suppressing my Russian roots, culture and language, but little did I know that I will undergo the same process upon my arrival in the UK. And from Baltic chain to the factory chain, I tried to acquire preferred national identifications, molding myself into a cultural chameleon. And maybe the reason it wasn't so hard to do the second time because I already undergone that process the first time in Lithuania and kind of learned from this experience from kind of hearing comments of I hate Russians but you're different back home to you're not like other Polish people which is I understand because in other presentations will speak this uh, that people don't really distinguish between Polish and Lithuanians and so on the same. Um, so eventually, like the one who got lost in um, her lies, I got tangled up in my personas. And this must have been a kind of point of fracture where so a burst of identity crisis and desire to claim what I had lost. And also, I guess, being in the safe haven that heterotopian spaces provide alone, allowed me both to explore and embrace my hybridity. So although here I must know there is still a significantly small number of discourses discussing the so-called other other, which is kind of Eastern or um, Central uh, Europe. And I'm guessing my current, current rebelliousness also comes from my experience as an ordinary Lithuanian migrant, a non-member of cultural import, so to say. I came to UK as an economical migrant, giving me an insight um, to often secluded Lithuanian communities that historically tend to separate themselves from the British neighbours. And part of it is also influenced by Lithuanian desire to kind of maintain the language, culture, traditions and food habits, which also be discussed a bit uh, later. But a bigger, even bigger part of this separation was influenced by the reception of the migrant communities by the British or even Scottish societies. And I say Scottish because Scotland is a lot of the time seen uh, portrayed as a quite progressive nation that kind of like, oh, England had a colonial past, but Scotland sort of like gets away with it. And it's actually, when you look to the like, kind of histor historical documents from Scotland, it kind of tells a different story. So, from forced name changes in the 19th and 20th century, early 20th centuries of Lithuanian migrants to other mistreatments by local governments the general reception of local folk in Scotland, a big part of the alienation has always played the media. So, um, tabloid media is not a new invention and it has always played a strategic part in the way Britain has treated immigrants. For example, in public consciousness, Britain is seen as a country that will not many Jews refugees, leading the Holocaust, but the British media of the time tells a different story. So Daily Mail and Daily Telegraph, for example, seem to be traditionally populist and propagandist newspapers that stirred popular anti-Semitism amongst boys called uh, the common folk. So in August 1938, a Daily Mail commentary about refugee Jews fleeting Nazi Germany began. The way stateless Jews from Germany are pouring in from every part of this country is becoming an outrage. So although this is not a focus of the talk, it's kind of illustrating an example of the way British media functioned um, for a while, uh, tabloid media. So in the beginning of the 20th century, 
Lithuanians in Scotland were not even recognised as Lithuanians and often, if not always, called Poles, which goes back to what I said at the beginning, that even from the 19th century until now, there's still no distinguish, this, this, it's still for people hard to distinguish between uh, two different nations. Um, this is illustrated also by a variety of articles such as Drunken Pole in Cork. John Wilson, a Pole, was fined shillings for being drunk and disorderly. Or my personal favourite comes from September 1914, titled Polish Miners in Scotland, Bay Indifference to the War. So the writer of the article uh, was referring to the home rule that Russia gave Poland, and he was really getting fired up and angry about this Polish people who don't care about their home country, they came here, like they just uh, just absolutely outrageous by the Polish people interviewed by the Lithuanians, so obviously the indifference doesn't seem that shocking. Um, so, as fun as these articles might be, they're quite damaging and not just solidifying Lithuanians as goals in people's consciousness, so of directing people's perceptions and treatment of immigrants and asylum seekers by erasing the culture, and also, for example, in official registers, people were registered as poll number one, poll number two, and basically all kind of former Russian Empire people called polls. But also influencing laws that were set against them. So xenophobic press and xenophobic people has always been in sync. Um, so there were many xenophobic and racist waves in British media, almost like fashion trends occupying the front pages. So the prejudice against Jews and the race riots and its coverage by the media gaslighting and racial tensions. And finally the topic of today's talk, an early 2000 Eastern European migration that somehow included under its umbrella everyone from, Bal from Baltic to the Balkans. Many of these articles seem so ludicrous it's actually hard to believe that they exist, but it becomes even more ludicrous when one tries to trace some form of lineage between them. So, unsurprisingly, like the text template, the food-related cultural habits were applied as a tool to other the aliens. In the case of Lithuanians, um, got lost there. <laughs> in, my notes. in the case of Lithuanians, um, there was the swans. The swans in 2003. This one's in 2004, 2006, 2007, 2010, and then 2011. And all essentially telling the same story, a wild barbaric foreign Eastern European people brutally killing and barbecuing swans. Yet the article that started against the trend um, is called Swan Big, Asylum Seekers Steal the King Swans for Barbecues. And that appears in the sun in 2003. And I would like to read now the actual article. So, asylum seekers steal the queen's birds for barbecues. Oh. Countless asylum seekers are barbecuing the queen's swamps. And here is actually the video of my own swamp bait that I did as a performance. It's just a short <laughs> Um, callous asylum seekers the barbecuing the queen swans, the sun reveals. East European poachers, no other protected from birds and debated traps, an official Metropolitan Police report says. The swans are plundered, are plundered from rivers and parks around London and southern England. They are then cooked and eaten. Hundreds of the graceful creatures have been killed. A police spokeswoman confirmed last night we are appealing for information over the disappearance of swans. The slaughter first came to light three months ago. Since then, swan numbers have plummeted and the crime is causing serious concern. The Met report confirms there have been incidents of swans being killed. It appears to be the work of Eastern European gangs. Steve Knight of the survey Swan Sanctuary said, to these people, they are perfectly acceptable delicacy. He then added that all swans belong to the crown, an injury or killing one means a 5,000 pounds fine or six months in jail. Asylum gang had two swans for roasting. Police swooped on a gang of Eastern Europeans and caught them red-handed about to cook a pair of royal swans. 
<laughs> the asylum seekers were barbecuing a duck in a park in Beckton, East London. Two dead swans were also found, concealed in bags and ready to be roasted. The discovery last weekend confirmed fears that immigrants are regularly spoofing the Queen's birds. A Metropolitan Police report explains European gangs attract them with bait, slurring them into traps. The scandal comes after reports by anglers who fish in the area and who complained that hungry asylum seekers were stripping our rivers of fish. Steve Knight of Sir Swan Sanctuary said, poaching of swans is becoming a serious problem. It is happening mainly in London, but we have also had reports from Wiltshire, Hertfordshire, and Essex. Sadly, it seems that that some people coming into this country have been ignoring our customs of leaving these beautiful birds alone. There has been a noticeable drop in swan numbers. In Enfield, North London, police and a wildlife liaison officer are patrolling the River Lee after swans disappeared. Tragic. A police spokeswoman said, the local community say the swan population has decreased considerably. A spokeswoman for the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds said, there has been a drop in the number of swans in the river Thames, and there's a suggestion they are being stolen. It seems there may be a connection with people from Eastern Europe. We no longer eat swans in this country, but people from various other parts of the world still do. Swans are totally protected and have been for hundreds of years. And the Fisher of the Met's Wildlife Investigation Unit said, we have reports that swans are being taken from various parts of London and eaten. It is a criminal offence. They are property of the Queen. Swans belong to the Crown under an ancient charter and are also protected by the Wildlife and Countryside Act. A police source said it's tragic that people from abroad don't respect our traditions. And um, last bit. So this article has been um, written in 2003 and before kind of former Eastern Bloc countries um, such as Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Slovakia and Slovenia joined the European Union. Um, Cyprus and Malta were also amongst the countries that joined the EU the same year. Right. Um, shifting from one union to the other, these countries were met with hostility from their wealthier counterparts. Fears of immigration and cheap labour influx generated an array of other myth myths regarding immigrant or asylum seekers. Amongst them, the most popular one seemed to be based on the idea of unacceptable habits that the migrants bring with them. It was often said that their values aren't aligned with ours. To reinforce the statement, as well as to pick up the popular beliefs amongst the common folk, a range of stories were fabricated. From infamous stories about dogs and cats being killed for Chinese takeaways, these tales evolved a framework that has been applied to target minority communities and generated myths such as Eastern European migrants eating protected swans, or African asylum seekers, some Alice in this case, stealing donkeys from zoos for food. So after this article, Swan Bay has been published, amongst many outraged citizens who are concerned about wildlife, animals, royal family, or immigration, and all kind of topics uh, touched by this article, there were a few that noticed that something was not right. A Serbian journalist, Nick Medic, has noticed that the article was rather short on facts, and despite the geography, no police station, let alone any single policeman, was identified or quoted. A person named towards the end of the article um, from Swan Sanctuary was obviously reacting to a call from a Sun reporter accepting that what he had been, been told was true. So Medic has taken upon himself to try and chase down the facts within this article. The police was unable to confirm any such reports and the only basis for this article was an internal memo circulated by Life, Life, Wildlife Protection Squad. So Nick Medic has complained to you a uh, press complaints commission and it has taken him six months of his time to eventually still lose his battle with the sun. After throughout investigation of the article, 
multiple back and forth emails with the PCC and the Sun. The Sun has published a last page clarification in really small letters um, about a front page uh, headlining article uh, it printed six months ago. So the clarification stated that what was presented as a factual account was in fact an interpretation. In the meantime, the damage has already been done and popular imagination has been filled with scenes of Polish and Lithuanian gangs brutally killing swans and disrespecting their host country's values and laws. In the meantime, Sun has also managed to publish a follow-up article called Now They Are After Our Fish. So, alluding to the same migrants now destroying the overall British wildlife. And whether online or through word of mouth, people are circulating these type of stories, recycling them, telling them, influencing public opinion, and in turn, public policies. So, people who describe themselves often as not racist or xenophobes, who concern British citizens, have taken these matters onto their own hands and into the public eye. And in one wildlife forum, a concerned couple says, I'm gobsmacked about this and feel quite sickened to the whole, about the whole situation. It is a question of what we do about it now. Or, I'm not racist at all. I don't give a monkey's what your skin colour is, but we, not, we cannot go to other countries and break their laws, and quite rightly too. Or another one, wildlife have no voice of its own. We must speak for it. I will sign any petition, if it's possible, to get one going. So as you can see from one fabricated story, a whole snowball of further reactions and consequences emerge. And like I said before, the article, uh, the articles that took the inspiration from the original story in the Sun has emerged in 2004, 6, 7, 10 and 11. And this is concerning swans and Eastern Europeans alone. So you might imagine the amount of urban myths that are circulated in regards to immigrants, asylum seekers, and refugees overall. And as fun as ludicrous as this portrayal of Lithuanians as very hungry people might seem, it is still a very dangerous tool of differ differentiating between bipolar entities such as us and them. And although post one big drama the article has been virtually removed or made inaccessible and deleted from all online sources and archives, there's one copy, a uh, digital copy, King Cross Live, King's Cross Library in London. It is still important to kind of bring these articles back to kind of to question them in public consciousness and especially in terms, I guess, of Brexit and how that's been unfolding. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it making me a, hungry yeah. every time I played it. I was like, hmm, okay. It was like, <laughs> like a jam kind of bomb inside that someone exploded. It's quite, quite dramatic. <laughs> um, I mean, cake and jam, that sounds pretty British to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know, I didn't think of that. <laughs> it was a Victorian sponge as well, so we were just uh, teasing the uh, British. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. <laughs> no, but it's, uh, it's, it's really great to see this article because it's, it's, it really brings back all the memories I moved here in 2004. So I don't remember the obviously 2003 article, but it was soon after I moved here there was this uh, article in the Sun about Polish people eating swans and this is, I remember this. Yeah, yeah, 2004, I think it was this in is uh, all the Daily Mail. Oh, Daily Mail, yeah, it was Daily Mail because it's. Uh, because I, I remember the sudden shift because it's like in 2004, uh, people didn't recognize like you know, Polish language on the street. It's been it's like sometimes I was mistaken by French, uh, you know. It's like people had no concept of where we're coming from, and all of the sudden <laughs> there was the swan story and everything changed. But um, uh, they may follow it uh, with uh, because uh, I, know, I know that all the uh, articles are removed because the Federation of Poles in Great Britain, they sue them for, uh, for racial those uh, because they published 80 racist articles within the four, first four years. Uh, so this one was just the beginning, but you know, there was the, another famous one was there with the, uh, with the Polish guy having intercourse with the back of the
but there was eight in total, and the court, uh, it was by the court order to remove them from online sources. Yeah, okay, yeah, because I really struggled to find it online. Uh, yeah, yeah, eight, yeah, eight articles were removed, so that's quite uh, success, yeah. but now it's uh, difficult to find documentation. Mm -hmm. Unintended consequence. <laughs> oh, uh, just <laughs> finding it difficult. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah, but I remember what the case was on. It was I mean, it was like a should. I mean, at least that article was a strategic move before the European. The, this country kind of should. John, must you feel for the discussion? <laughs> <laughs> to create kind of yeah, a certain stigma um, towards immigrants that they fear it was the same as like when Romania was joining the. There was all this like circulation of these oh, that yeah. like gypsies yeah. are attacking. And yeah, like, because it was obviously all mixed with Roma and, and, and Roma community and uh, stereotypes of, and the mixture of um, yeah, those preconceptions. There's something very interesting first in uh, what you mentioned about Simon Seng, and again, you know, all of these articles, none of them actually spoke to someone from Central East Europe. Mm -hmm. to, to have a voice in the matter. There was, a, there was no voice whatsoever. So that, and it's not just uh, uh, those damaging but at the same time ridiculous articles, but also the serious uh, articles, the kind of visibility of someone who is from Central Eastern Europe was not there. There was no mm -hmm. one ever on the panel. Everybody spoke about us, but no one spoke with us in a sense. Yeah. Uh, and there's something very, I, I kind of, Thought about because I used to live in Krakow from Poland, and Krakow became like a destination for uh, hen and stag parties uh, for British uh, uh, people, and and, and uh, it got to the extreme of uh, you know lots of arrests uh, in Poland. There were arrests there. Uh, there was few bars that stopped uh, allowing parties like that to happen. Uh, so there was a lot of kind of news about that in Poland, and those news migrated here. And, and when we're talking about respect someone's customs and kind of being a visitor somewhere or kind of doing this, and suddenly the other way around doesn't function. And it's something very common in the kind of colonial think, experience of uh, um, spirit, almost. Yeah, true. I mean, I guess like um, I was reading somewhere that maybe the Britain's geography kind of made it, in a sense, like a bit in hostile country because they had, it never had such a huge um, sort of circulation of people in there. Um, so it's kind of a thing even from the uh, 14th century, the way it kind of like British Eritreans and Fre uh, French and Flemish people is kind of like it's quite different to the way people in, let's say, the mainland Europe are referring to to each other. So it's kind of maybe the hostility is kind of somehow inbred in the <laughs> nationality. I mean, now I'm just like <laughs> completely like high, high for the size of the <laughs> I'm not sure about that. We've we've had large influxes of people from other places uh -huh. throughout. I mean, due to colonialism and uh, other things. Um, I'm, I, yeah, I, I just I'm not sure of the idea that we we've somehow closed off, or we are closed closed off perhaps um, in our perception from Europe. But I'm not sure that's because we don't have people coming here. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if it's a good time, but I just wanted to ask about um, uh, identities a little bit and, and, and from both of you how, how, how we feel, because I'm very interested uh, on, on this perception, because the Baltic chain was this event joining three countries together, or three republics at the time, uh, and now sometimes I sense that there's, there's this strong separation, uh, uh, need of separating those three countries, and uh, uh, you know, I know it's happened with, with, with many different countries, and, and I think this is this need of, uh, of having their own identity, but we listen to this song uh, in three languages and all people together, but now it seems uh, um, there is tend to Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia to present them as very, very separate and very, very different countries. I don't know how we feel about those identities. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think it was probably, you know, created in order for us to get out of the Soviet Union. So obviously there was a plan for it, and then the plan wasn't there anymore. And I think that uh, it's interesting because I think it's all political. 
and probably European Union also played a role in that because we all kind of like had to create our own identity, yeah. you know, and sort of compete economic. Well, I don't know, like prove who's the best economically, and who's strongest politically, and who's like most towards the West. Mm -hmm. So I think Estonians probably, like from what I know, identify much more with Scandinavia because of language similarities. Latvians and Lithuanians are kind of. There is still this idea of brotherhood, but uh, but I think that I don't know what what it's like at the moment. But I know that at some point Latvia was stronger economically, and Lithuania was stronger politically. So there was this kind of you know. So there is a bit of, of that game. I don't think that yeah that unity is the same, but the memory of it I guess helps. Yeah. Does migration affect that? Does being in the UK, for instance, make people feel closer together than they would if they were living in Lithuania or Latvia or Estonia? I, I, I mean, I also kind of uh, wanted to maybe disagree a little bit because I think actually Baltic unity is almost like making a comeback or revival in terms of like especially cultural. Um, maybe Baltic identity as in, um, I don't know, kind of going back to like 12th century and the symbols and things like that and the kind of the folkloric elements and I think there sort of yeah maybe through fashion more so it's like having this almost like gentrification of them in a sense but that is like unifying those three countries I feel and sort of and I think the problematic in here is also that the Soviet sort of period of kind of like Russian occupation is just being sort of checked like cut out and sort of like put away and then we have present and then the balls and then whatever happened then doesn't really matter and had no influence on lives. Um, at least that's the kind of the, the image that I sort of construct from following what is sort of happening in terms of like yeah cultural trends maybe. I might, I might be wrong. <laughs> but to answer your question I think that um, I find that's just my personal experience that people who actually share similar, uh, so either that's Romania or Poland, when you're abroad, having this Soviet past actually helps. And this is not about political history, it's more about education, like some kind of weird cultural codes or something. There is some something where you can just tune in, you know, like certain, I don't know, the explosion of atomic plant in Ukraine or something, where everyone has a memory about and, and I think it's just easy to connect with those kind of crazy little things or the way our education was constructed, you know, the way. So I think that, that I definitely feel. And it comes even unexpectedly because I don't think that I knew any Romanians before I arrived to London and then suddenly you discover that actually you have this past together which you didn't know that you have, you know, like, so it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, I, I guess like we're all a little bit conditioned by that past. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a oh yes, I have a related question actually, um, which is, so are you saying the Baltic state or the concept of the Baltic state was something a bit opportunistic, created um, for, so before this revolution or for the states to um, get rid of the Soviet Union, uh, rule, so it wasn't something uh, yeah, more concrete that united these three states? to be Baltic in, the, in an identity sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, I personally mm. think that, because uh, again, like what you still also you know, noted, if we take Baltic Sea as a reference, then we have many more states. So why do we talk about Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania? Mm -hmm. And Lithuania and Latvia, we definitely share kind of roots in terms of language. And there was Prussia as well, which was another country which disappeared after Germany, so Estonia actually is very culturally different. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you know, it is it is constructed, and mm -hmm. uh, I think, and I mean, of course, now there is this kind of romantic idea, but uh, but I think it was more kind of political move because there were, it, it wasn't only about the people holding hands. There was a I think there was also an agreement between the three countries there were three guys who were supposed to burn themselves and that was supposed to be like a big statement and 
I think only the Lithuanian guy actually died, like the others somehow, like, I don't know, something changed. But like, there was a series of events that they did in order to show the world that, you know, there are three Baltics by the mm -hmm. Baltic Sea trying to get out. So it, it, is, yeah, it is interesting because probably the idea of the Baltic state is very successful outside the Baltic state. So, uh, right, people rarely, I mean, often speak about Baltic state, not about specific uh, Lithuania or Latvia. Or, yeah. So it would be interesting to see if this idea is more successful outside than actually in these countries. Right, somehow, yeah. I had another question and something that uh, I'm wondering about uh, the ratio of identities post-Soviet. Uh, what I mean uh, uh, in Latvia, the ratio of Russian language slowly and kind of uh, removing it from schools. Uh, 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 people who were uh, sent to Latvia from Russia because there were families, you know, there to reviews, so everybody got sent somewhere at one point or another. So I mean, they don't have national, uh, national identity. They passport, that uh, uh, Latvian passport. The same thing kind of happened with Bulgaria and Turks in Bulgaria when they were imposed to have Christian names or Catholic uh, Christian names and uh, many of them returned back to Turkey even though they had their time and, uh, mm -hmm. and they lived there and that was their region as well. So I'm kind of wondering about that internal erasure and something you mentioned about this uh, cutting off USSR from the history of like it's been there and let's forget about it or maybe there's something about it that binds us together in some way a different way but I'm kind of wondering about what's your expression uh, what do you think about this kind of uh, political moves which also are about bringing the branding identity of uh, the country which is so pushed forward through the European Union Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. I understood like what the question is exactly. No, um, I'm, I'm just wondering what do you guys think about. Uh, it wasn't really a question, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was wondering about your opinions on like or experiences and thoughts on uh, this kind of internal erasure in in relation to kind. Of, uh, Can I add something? Yeah. To my also a question. Yes. Um, so I was thinking about the same thing, so um, the work that I've done, which is quite limited on the Baltics, is also looking um, at the, the complex, the memory complex within, within the Baltic states, which are often between um, the way that, say, that the ethnic Russians remember that period, um, period of occupation, and the way that ethnic Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians remember that period of occupation. And, and having visited some of the museums in the region, you do get that kind of um, the Russian perspective is, is not there and it's not present, but then there are other conflicts around statues and memorials and that kind of thing. Um, and I was wondering what happens to that in the process of migration as well, so when you have people from, from the Baltic states here, does that kind of memory conflicts, do they persist or um, is the ident does the identity shift in terms of, of how, you, how people from the region perceive themselves? I know you said that you were... I mean, you I had Russian I, I, yeah, I don't have as well. to speak for everyone, <laughs> but I could maybe again say from my personal perspective, I found that um, maybe it does because I felt that in Lithuania there's a strong, and it's probably was politically constructed, a sort of set, strong sense of Lithuanian identity and kind of Lithuanian identity against kind of Soviet Union and against Soviet Union of crimes and stuff and I mean it's a very multifaceted subject and I think that's what I'm kind of interested in because like um, we were talking before like you said it's like this different levels of memory and for instance my mom has a like my my mom was kind of like a, a young sort of student who traveled in the ex-Soviet Union and for her it was like a innocence freedom and she remembers this it's really amazing time, we didn't have much, it was really simple, blah 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 blah, but it was kind of like, but there were certain things that we don't have now, and she misses those things, and maybe for a person who, and who's village, uh, living in a rural society, and whose, uh, let's say, farm was destroyed and converted into, um, 
uh, with the communal farms, which is a completely different experience again, no other one oriented people that um, yeah, I had to deal with KGB agents, and it's just such a multi layered um, subject. And I think maybe immigrating just kind of gives that distance to reflect in it, and also maybe gives a bit more safe space to reflect in it, if that makes sense, because it's sort of, I guess, like with maybe even speaking in Lithuania about these subjects, it's sort of like I try to be kind of careful the way I word things, not to be kind of not to appear as an pro-Soviet Union, I'm just saying that we should be considering this history from a little different angle than that we are now as a kind of uh, sort of widespread amnesia. It's kind of, I mean, as an example, there could be maybe Lebanon and the civil war there where it's just completely cut out and undiscussed subject that it's just, oh, it's fine, it was just, it just, well, no. <laughs> so it's kind of the same with this kind of these memories. It doesn't happen. It doesn't matter. But that's not that's not good. That we went back to Baltic or <laughs> identities and and um, yeah. I mean, I think that it's it's extremely interesting and extremely broad because um, I mean I made this one short film before, which was about uh, Soviet propaganda for kids. Which actually, so there were all these propaganda books. Uh, in my bookshelves, which were like about Lenin or like, you know, le learning ABC with kind of Russian symbols and stuff. But uh, of course, I didn't ever feel, because my first memory is sort of like, you know, over revolution and, you know, there's like holding hands. And so it felt like the, this thing never really affected me. So of course, we all refused, like, not all, but like a lot of people refused to learn Russian as a second language at school. You know, and instead, like, she was like German, she never learned anyway. So, so there was this, like, there was some kind of crazy thing which we probably absorbed from our parents, but actually, we didn't really experience any badness, you know, we kind of learned about it. And I think the, the moment when I realized that, you know, there is an issue with identity was when I started traveling, and when I lived in Turkey, everyone who was like slightly fair was Natasha, you know, and I, and you know Natasha is immediately the kind of like prostitute because they had all these, uh, you know, Ukrainians and like, I don't know, other Eastern Europeans and probably Lithuanians, I don't know, going there and like, you know, doing prostitution basically. So I was extremely offended, like I just really, I didn't like them at all, like, and, and then I really struggled, I had to kind of come up with, uh, so what is it, how do I actually sell this kind of being Lithuania and then, at that time, it was like citizen of the world. We are all kind of citizens of the world. You know, it doesn't matter now. You, you know, European Union. We all. And then you arrive to London, and suddenly you have this class system, which is also another challenge because we, I didn't know what that was. You know, and then in every conversation I had with English people, it was always my parents come from middle class, my parents come from this kind of class, and you don't really know what that is. And the, I thought it was really funny, and I was like, okay, so what class do you think I come from? If my mother is like this, you know, and I was like. Uncomfortable. So it's, uh, and then now Lithuania is this green thing, which is green is very popular, you know. We are all eating ecological food, and Lithuania has all these herbs, and so now it's great to be pagan, you know, and it's kind of nice to be Lithuanian now because we can, you know, so it's, it's, it's really complex. And you know, this kind of being like taken from one place and put to another place, because we also had this part of history where. Uh, Poland uh, took over our capital city, so, um, and then like, interestingly, I was talking about it to a Polish friend of mine who is an artist as well, and her grandmother was the one who was taken from Vilnius back to Dansk, and it was extremely traumatic for her, and she lived all her life with this beautiful memory of Vilna, you know, and, uh, and dreaming of that house that they had. But in the meantime, I think from Dansk, they kicked out all the Germans. So some ladies would come to her house wanting to see the house where she lived at that time and she wouldn't let them in, you know, because like, so it's it's just a mess, this history, you know, of like people moving around and kind of identities shifting and carrying this kind of romantic memory. But yeah, it's interesting. I don't think it's ever complete as well. I think it's like a flux and... It kind of reminds me like, uh most famous Polish uh, writer, uh, Adam Mickiewicz, yeah. starts his uh, most famous book, or like a text, by saying, uh, Lithuania, you are my country. 
Oh, it's like Muskevich is... Uh, is it, yeah, but, <laughs> but, but the, the time it was uh, kind of... Yeah, but it's uh, because, you know, the, the Polish-Lithuanian history is, is very difficult and uh, it's almost something I would never... I just don't discuss or don't try anymore to discuss with yeah. Lithuanians because we just cannot agree even on facts and uh, not to mention the interpretation of those historical events. So it's just... This is something left, but I, uh, but, uh, I agree that uh, Lithuanian identity is uh, 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 difficult and in relation to Poland is, is more than complicated. And even for us sometimes, because I feel different if I'm speaking to someone who's Lithuanian, is Lithuanian speaking Lithuanian or uh, Lithuanian of Polish origin or Lithuanian mixed with Russian, and then you know it's very different pictures and also. You, I, you do get very different sense of identity and, and, and also many in Lithuanian depending on where our people uh, coming from because there are so many Lithuanians who are speaking perfect Polish and sometimes we even forget they are from Lithuania simply because they, they speak without accent like you know for generations. But uh, but Poland has this uh, poet, it's Polish national poet Adam Mickiewicz and, and his main national poem which we all have to memorize, uh, he says, Lithuania, my country, but you know, we all, always thought, but, but he means Poland, he says, yeah, yeah, but he yeah. means Poland. He means Poland, that's a kind of, because... <laughs> so like, we can call him Polish was... national poet, because by saying yeah. Lithuania, he means Poland. Yeah, but the funny thing is that so we a... think that that's Lithuanian Poland. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So exactly, like, yeah. yeah. And, and I remember recently I saw this advert in Lithuania, because we have two lines with had him like he was a composer like this composer and painter uh, and this advert was saying be like Chilonis study in Poland mm -hmm. like <laughs> another you know new kind of yeah <laughs> <laughs> No, it is a very complex history and it's, it's very interesting because it's, uh, but uh, I think we uh, try to distance ourselves from this uh, um, uh, because I don't know, there is, I don't think there is a word in English for um, people who are forced to move from Przesiedlanice like, we, we, because the whole, uh, because it's like... Um, it's a I guess. Yeah, because if people, um, uh, uh, the borders of uh, Poland shifted from east to west so we've lost eastern territory but we gained something from Germany which was German so uh, so what's happened is just German left or they were basically forced out but you know most of them want, just wanted to go so there was like uh, the mass uh, I don't know 300 kilometer strip of land in the west which was just empty so what's happened is like because the Poland, Polish people uh, were forced out of the eastern countries like Lithuania and Ukraine and Belarus and they were literally forced to inhabit those because it's like it was the whole you know um, uh, decision of uh, victory in uh, in Yalta that you know the, that was the uh, the Soviet Union wanted uh, more land of different countries but that we were given this German land like Wrocław which is now like massive uh, cultural capital of Poland. 70 years ago, uh, it was just German, it was built by Germans, inhabited for, by Germans for 500 years and all of a sudden. So you go to Wrocław, which is a uh, very western uh, Polish country, and everyone from there has been my roots. And then uh, it's like, and you have those cities in Poland now where nobody lives there for generation, everyone is from 1945 onwards. Because, yeah. So there is no uh, this emotional attachment and the history. Might be interesting actually, um, perhaps another time, because <laughs> I just started thinking about this to to think about those kinds of settler colonialisms in yeah. relation to what we tend to think of as being settler colonialism, right? Which is um, in reference to places like Australia and the US and Canada, because uh, I don't think I've really seen that part of the world included in conversations about. Well, it's, uh, bit, uh, in Poland, I think I find there is a more and more discussion because of this whole uh, because you know uh, the Poland uh, and Lithuania was called Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth for a number of centuries, but uh, but even this as a country, let's say it was Polish Lithuanian country, but it included Ukraine and Belarus and, and lots of other entities and um, and you know even if we. I don't know if we will ever be able to 